Okay. Okay. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm so excited that you can join us once more on our program, Living Well. I thank everyone for coming. Today we have an exciting topic. We have Dr. Sinclair who will be speaking to us regarding breast cancer, living your best life. I know Dr. Sinclair has been on our platform before. She's no stranger to some of you, but Dr. Sinclair graduated from the University of Loma Linda University with a doctorate degree, and she practiced here in Central Florida as a general surgeon. Welcome, Dr. Sinclair. We're so glad to have you. Before you start, though, I just want to state our disclaimer. This presentation is for educational purposes only. The information shared here is based on research, personal experience, and biblical scriptures. Our goal is to educate you on the topic, not to assess, diagnose, or prescribe any form of treatment. If you have any specific conditions or situation in which you are concerned, you are encouraged to speak with uh, or the advice from your personal physician. Again, this is for educational purposes only. And I, I, I'm glad that you are here to listen to Dr. Sinclair. So Dr. Sinclair, thanks for coming again to join our platform. We are so excited that you are here. And I'm so glad you're always willing when we call upon you to answer the call. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We're going to get right into it, and so we can have time at the end for questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where did my screen go? Okay. Here we are. We are right here. So um, breast cancer, know the facts. Uh, you know, every year, um, and sometimes even during the year, I try to update the presentation. So there's some different things in there that we may not have talked about before. And one of the things that I found out this year is some very exciting news that we'll talk about closer to the end. Now, breast cancer is the second most common cancer in women in the U.S., because the first, the most common cancer, unfortunately, is lung cancer. Um, in, in other places like the Caribbean and stuff, the breast cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in women. Um, breast cancer is treatable with excellent results. And these are the facts. And also it can and does, uh, can and, and does occur in men. Okay, so it's, it's it, we're mammals by scientific definition, and all mammals, male and female, have breast tissue. So any tissue you have in the body is subject to cancers, including men can get breast cancer. So here are the facts. Um, some of you may need to change where your screen is so you can see the rest of this. It's about um, just under 300,000 cases per year. Um, this death rate is actually a little lower than it, um, than the numbers we have here, because now only 10%, actually it's under 10%, will die from breast cancer. The survival rate, and the five-year survival rate is now 90.8, and that's taken all stages of breast cancer. And one of the reasons is because the message is finally going out and people are able to get treated and taken care of as well as discover it. You know, once upon a time, most breast cancers were noted by a husband or um, a significant other during intimacy because they're the ones who are palpating people's breath um, because women just weren't getting mammograms on a regular basis. Now, because of encouraging people to get mammograms and to get um, evaluated, we have a larger number of persons being diagnosed earlier in life. And so we have a much better survival rate than we did before. Now, just a little bit about breast anatomy. Breast um, is mostly fatty tissue. All this yellow stuff is fat. Don't, 
let them tell you anything, you know, those exercises, those of you are old enough, remember, if you say, I must, I must, I must increase my bust. The only thing you were doing is increasing this muscle here, which is the pectoralis muscle, the muscles and serratus and those that are behind the breast. The breast is made up of lobules and ducts. Lobules are where the milk is made and ducts are where it comes through. And even when you're not, even if you're not pregnant, even if you don't have children or past the age of having children, the lobules are still present, the ducts are still present, so you can still get drainage from that area. Okay. Um, this is a blown up picture. You see the 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 lobules and the ducts. Now most of the cancers start in the ducts, even though the lobules take up more space, most cancers start in the ducts. And that's why, you know, people say, well, why can't you just leave the person's nipple in place if you take out the whole breast? Because all the ducts come to the nipple and that's, that's why the cancer is always there. The, the second most common cancer is lobular carcinoma. And then there's a variety of others that have to do with the duct, different places in the duct and nodule, but those are the two most common ones, okay? Uh, and so that's why you have that. Um, and that's why men can get and do get breast cancer because they do have the ducts. They do have the structure, even though they're not going to produce any milk. Um, these numbers are still pretty much true. Stage zero are those who have what's called carcinoma in situ. It's a Latin term, meaning it's only, um, I don't know how to go back. Oh, I do know. It's only in the lining of the duct. Because even though cancer starts in the duct, it actually starts to grow and occur. But there are some cancers that only in the lining of the duct, they haven't gone out into the main cells. And those cancers are with treatment 100% survivable. Stage one is actually, it used to be 92, it's actually a little higher now. Um, because we have better detection, we have better treatment, we have found out different things about the tumor that we're able to treat. And stage two is also higher. Stage three, unfortunately, is still around here, and stage four is still down here. But the, the reason that it's so high is because uh, those of you who remember your mats, most of the cancers we find are here. And so that's why we have such a high survival rate because we have, and even if you look at it, you know, you still have a large, that's still more than um, more than almost three quarters who are still gonna live even with a later stage. And that's still over a third who are gonna live with a later stage because we do have better treatment now. But here's the thing, mammograms. Um, they are much more sophisticated than they were years ago. And so we're better able to detect things we're better able to do biopsies earlier because about 20 something years ago, just over 20 years ago, the techniques of doing needle biopsy were developed and they have enabled us to be able to do a biopsy in our office and get a diagnosis, not having to take the woman to the OR just to do a biopsy. So you get earlier diagnosis, you get early treatment and you get excellent outcome. It's not rocket science. It just makes sense. Now, this, this mammogram, we show these are three different mammograms. Breast um, can be uh, three, uh, actually, it's, it's five different categories of breasts. This is just your breasts. But I put this here to show that this defect here is a cancer. But you notice this breast is mostly fatty, okay? Here, there's a cancer. You notice there's more of this fibrous tissue in this breast. And here, there's a cancer but the, dense, the breast is more dense. Two things about dense breast. It's not anything that you can do. You either just have it or you don't. Just like, oh, you know, I have this complexion, I have this color eyes, I have this texture here. That's what it is. We used to think the reason we didn't find that people with um, the more dense breast, we weren't finding the tumors because obviously, right? Because we have, you can tell, you don't have to be rocket science to see that this is easier to find than this. But we also found out that after you made adjustments for that, uh, the change in the density, that patients with dense breasts actually do have a higher risk of cancer. Um, and that's pro it probably has to do with just how your, your breast is formed. Okay. Here we have what we call A, B, C, and D. This is, um, this is the definition of the breast 
density. And again, these are what we call fatty replaced breasts, okay? You see this more as women get older because those ligaments um, get weaker and your breast then fills up with more fat. This is the area where most people are in terms of their breasts, when it still has some fibrousness to it, a, a little bit, a lot more. And then there's some women who, you know, if you try if you try to do mammograms on really young women, this is what it looks like for the most part, even if they have really big breasts, even though, and you think it's fatty, it's not. It's very dense. Um, but there's some women who their breast stays pretty much like this most of their lives. And they um, they have a double whammy. One, um, they do actually have a higher risk. But also, as you can see, cancer gets more difficult to see in a mammogram as the breast density increases. One of the things that we have now with the um, breast, with the 3D breast mammograms and so on, it helps us in terms of finding stuff even in the denser breast because we're looking at it. The analog mammograms literally was like your analog TV. And the mammograms we have now, first we had the digital ones, which is like, I, I don't know if anybody remember the earlier generation digital TV. They were nice, but they were so bulky. But now the, these HD TVs, it looked like the person is coming off the screen to you. And so some of that same technology has been applied. And so even patients with breasts like these were able to find mammograms sooner than we would have before. And this is another picture of it. Again, fatty replaced breasts. You see some mild fibrous tissue, some moderate fibrous tissue, dense fibrous tissue. Uh, and it helps or hinders our detection. Now, these are actual pictures of what a cancer will look like. Um, they, but you, you notice the breast is there and there's something there. This one has a few calcium deposits there. And the reason, this is called a CC view and this is called an ML view. And the reason we do two views is because they would need to have a better idea of where the cancer is. This is would be on the more on the outside of the breast and the upper breast. This is, this a cancer like this, by the time you would have felt it, like this cancer, you the person may be able to feel it. And even so it's advanced, but a cancer like this, the, the only time you'd feel it is when it's that's really big. And you see, it's already on the muscle, which means that it has much more chance of spreading. And so, you know, the mammograms are important. And people say to me, well, I don't have family history. Family history only increases your risk. Um, it ups your risk up, up to about 20 something percent. But you're still at risk. With, but even without family history, you're still at risk. So that's why mammograms are important because it'll make the difference between us finding this rather than finding this. On ultrasound, you see that irregular shape. A lot of young women have lumps in their breasts. They're, it, they're smooth, the edges are smooth. Cancer tends to be more like when a stone hits your windshield. That's what cancer looks like on the mammogram. And on the ultrasound, the edges are just not well defined. And here's another picture. Now, this is a much smaller tumor. Again, you would never be able to feel this until it got much bigger. But look at the, and also the ultrasound store are much more high definition than they used to be. So this is less than a centimeter. And you can still see it there with the jagged edges. There's no light behind it. So these are some of the things we look for. These are some other ultrasound pictures. This one is really like, when you see a picture like this, you know it's cancer. You don't, you, the biopsy is just to tell what type. And so get some other information. A picture like this, you know it's cancer. This has a possibility that it may be um, not cancer because it has some benign as well as uh, malignant characteristic. But this, we know it's cancer right away. This too. This is kind of in between as well. So the, the, the different modalities have different ways in which they help us define what is cancer, what is not, what is suspicious. And the fact that something is suspicious doesn't mean you have cancer. It just means that we can't tell for certain just by the x-rays, so we need to do a biopsy. There are two sets of risk factors. There are those that are unchangeable, and then there are those that are changeable. The unchangeable risk factors, gender and age, okay? 
these are actually the two biggest risk factors for breast cancer. Most breast cancers occur in women. Only 6% of breast cancers occur in men. So that means that 94% of breast cancers occur in women. And most of the time it's in women once you hit that um, late 50s, early 60s, that's where the bulk of the cancer is, up to about 70. Now, there is a trend, and even up to this week, I had a lady come in who was in her, um, she's not even 80 yet, but here you have somebody who is living well, living a great life. She's not overweight. She, I, I, I don't even think she was on any high blood pressure or anything like that medication. And some family doctor told her that while she got to be 70, she didn't need to take any more mammograms. Well, she came to us with a mammogram that kind of looks like one of those. This is not hers. Excuse me. Um, that, that looks like those because it is simply not true. While it's true that if somebody is has had a major stroke and is somewhere in a nursing home, I know I would not do a screening mammogram on them. Okay. But anybody, and especially here in Florida, if you're living a life and you're you're out and about, even if you're walking with a walk or something like that, but you're out and about, you are living a life, you need to get a mammogram. I have several patients in their 80s living independently. And they had cancer and, and then they came in with the same story that somebody said to them once, oh, once you get to be telling you don't need a mammogram, not true. You do need a mammogram because it's better to find something um, like this than to find something like this, okay? Or this, you know, you want to find it when only a skilled radiographer or a breast cancer doctor. You don't want to find it when a, a regular nurse, anybody passing by, see that mammogram, anybody. You just think about, it. let's go back to this for a second. Even if you're not a doctor and you and you and somebody put that mammogram up, what you, you know something is wrong, right? And 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 you you want to find it, like I said, like this, where you can barely see it. And they do the ultrasound. That's when you want to find it because that's when you're going to be in those high percentiles. So you need to be studied because as you get older, you're at risk. Family history does increase the risk. Um, it depends on whether it's a first degree relative that is a mother, daughter, sister. Okay, those are first degree relative or son. I, I do have a, a man that I took care of some years ago who had breast cancer and his mother had breast cancer. And, and I think he was gene positive, even though we weren't doing much genetic testing at the time. This is a few years back. So family history does increase your risk. Usually uh, it takes you from the one in eight, which is about 11% risk over a lifetime of developing breast cancer. So somewhere up in the in the mid to high 20s, depending on the risk. Um, if you have multiple, if you don't have a first degree, like some people, okay, your mother is the only child, right? Um, and she, so she may not have breast cancer, but you have like three aunts and two cousins on that side and they have breast cancer. You, you, we will test those persons as well because they probably have that r increased risk. Because when it comes to cancer, we know that there's a, even if you don't have the, the gene positive, which we'll get to, even if you don't have that gene, we know it's, it's genetic and environment. It's a combination of both. But what we know from genetics is there's a matter of what's called expression. Um, that's why there's some identical twins who don't look exactly alike. But when you look at them, when they look check the placenta and everything, they were identical twins. Real, the, what, the reason why, because there's there's things called incomplete penetration, meaning the gene is there, but it, it it doesn't have this effect as much as an an incomplete expression, meaning the gene is there. So family history is important, and um, if you have first degree relatives or multiple second degree relatives, then you should um, get tested. Uh, we the main gene that we're still talking about is BRCA. This is much more common in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and some other European descent. But the fact of the matter is we know, okay, 
all of us here, whether you're my complexion, Emlyn's complexion, or somebody lighter complexion, we all know if you watch um, Henry Louis Gates' program, This American Life, that the, the proof is not in what I look like. The proof is in what those genes say, okay? And we all know because of the history of the transatlantic slave trade that those genes are floating around, okay? They may not be expressed, but they're floating around. So um, this is the most common study one. This is the earliest one. But there are other genes that we're looking at now. And the one other thing to remember is that this gene, you know, people think of it as breast cancer. But this cancer here, ovarian cancer, is much more deadly any given day than breast cancer. Because there are no mammograms. There's nothing to test for. And you, your abdomen is just that empty space there. Even if you've had a hysterectomy and, and your ovary is still there, that's a big empty space where that thing can grow before anybody can actually detect it. There's no routine test for it. And it's much more deadly than breast cancer. So when we think of the gene, we don't just think of breast. We, you know, people tend to think of breast because no matter what anybody says, whether you're double A or triple G, breast is what defines women. That's why trans people, if if you're transitioned from male, female to male, you try to get rid of breasts. I've had people who have come to me, they want me to take off their breasts, even though there's nothing wrong with their breasts because they want to be a man. Okay. And if you're trans in the other way, you take the hormones so you can develop breasts because breasts is what identify you as female, as woman, right? So there's a lot more psychology associated with the breast, but that gene, this is the one that kills more people than the breast cancer. Breast density, as we talked about, is, 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 is it is what it is. It's like blue eyes, black hair, brown eyes, straight hair, curly hair. Yeah, I have it or you don't. It's not because um, it's, it's just you, okay? And because it's you, uh, we just know now that we're more aware, um, sometimes those patients will get called back and get additional studies, including one I don't have here, which is uh, MRIs that we do and other studies that we do just to, um, to, to try to increase our chances of finding something, okay? Genetic testing, I mentioned it. It's available for breast prostate, ovarian, colon, and also pancreatic, and also skin. It's interesting. I've had a patient, and I actually had a friend of mine who tested positive for high potential for skin cancer, and she looks just like all of us here. But of course, as I said, transatlantic slavery, right? So those genes are in there. Bob Marley died from melanoma, okay? That's what Bob Marley died from. He didn't die from anything else. He died from melanoma. Okay. And um, I'm uh, the end of the month at Windermere, I'm going to be talking about breast cancer. And I'm also going to be talking about skin cancers, because that's something that we as people of color are not as cognizant of as we should be. Because like I tell you, th those genes are in there. These are the risks that really we should be paying attention to, right? Obesity and high fat diet. I, I cannot overemphasize this because they go hand in hand. The, with the processed foods, with the sedentary lifestyle, somewhere I was watching um, Go Healthy for Good. It's a program on Hope Channel. And one of the doctors on there, he said, sitting is the new smoking. Sitting is the new smoking. Because we were so active as a people and I'm talking about not black people. I'm talking about people in general. Everybody used to walk. Everybody walked everywhere, you know? And then we started developing these urban centers. Um, and then we developed a thing called suburbia. So now we don't live in the city where we walk to the store, walk to that store. We, we live out there. We have to drive everywhere. We have to drive to this. We have to drive to that. We have to take time to exercise because sitting is a new smoking. And when you look at the obesity statistics for the U.S., I don't have them in the slide. You look at them. You just check them. You, you can just type it in and Google it. You know, we have stuff. We, we used to have to go to Encyclopedia Britannica, but now you can just Google it or, or Siri or whatever. 
And you look at the obesity rate in the US, especially, you look at it in 1980s, 1990s, 2000, et cetera, and you see how big we get. That's from the our diet. And it's, uh, it's not just um, a vegetarian diet because how many of you have been to churches and potluck and everything is vegetarian and everybody there is obese? And I'm going to stop and digress for just a second, even though I'm going to get back to it. You know, one of the things that I think is unfortunate in our churches, especially our Black churches, is the fact that we continue to ignore obesity in our church. Every time I, I sit down and I see that half of the choir and praise team is obese, I'm not talking about a little extra weight. These, these men and women are obese. Pastors getting up to speak and they're obese. And no one talks about it. If they walk into church with a cigarette in their hand, we'll be jumping all over them. But yet still, we ignore it. And, and we're talking about health. We get frightened at breast cancer and we ignore the fact that those are the things that are killing us. Let me tell you, exercise and maintaining a healthy weight. Alcohol and tobacco. Tobacco especially is good for nothing, okay? It is good for nothing. It is associated with almost every cancer there is, all every major cancer, not lung, colon, um, bladder, you name it. Tobacco is associated with it. Not to mention the major diseases. The number one cause of death in this country is cardiovascular disease. Tobacco is right up there. Kidney disease. Um, it worsens everything else. The, 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 the blood vessel disease, it makes everything worse, okay? Um, back in the, I want to say the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, they had the studies and they showed that women who are premenopausal actually had a lower risk of cardiac disease. And when they became postmenopausal, then their risks were compar comparable to men. So they got an idea, okay, let's start giving women um, hormones so that they don't go into menopause. And does anyone know what Premarin, how the name Premarin came about? If you do on your urine. Pause urine. Pregnant mares urine. urine. You're right, Ms. Evelyn. Pregnant <laughs> mares urine. Okay. So that's what they, they took it from. And, and what they found out, not only did it not help cardiac disease, but it had multiple problems. So now there are some people who need to be on, and there's bioidentical and all this kind of stuff. There's some people who do need to be on hormonal therapy because they have severe um, hot flashes and some other things going on, but it is no longer routinely prescribed. Okay. It's no longer routinely prescribed. And we look at other methods to try to deal with the symptoms rather than um, just using hormonal therapy. And it also showed a, a slight increase in uterine cancer as well. Um, breastfeeding actually has been shown to decrease the risk, but that's not going to affect everybody because um, some people tried and weren't able to, some people weren't able because of circumstances. Early pregnancy just means that from the time you've had your first period, which um, that's part of the problem we have now, we used to have our peers like 12 or so. Now girls are getting their peers as, as, as young as eight. Part of that is the hormone in the food chain. You know, the chickens are, if you look at a chicken leg years ago, and you look at a chicken leg now, it is incredulous as to the size of the chicken leg. And that's all hormones. And so now the girls are getting it. So what we're talking about is the time from menarche, which is when your period starts, the age to the time when you have your first child. So most women, if you have had your, your first child in your 20s, then there's no difference. But women who uh, haven't had their ch children until they're in their mid to late 30s do have a slightly high risk. It is not a tremendous high risk, but this has been shown after they eke out everything. Radiation treatment, we're not talking about mammograms. We're not talking about x-rays. We're talking about radiation treatment. Who are we talking about? There are women who had to um, get radiation treatment because of hyperthyroidism. There are people who had radiation treatment because of Hodgkin's lymphoma. I know several young people um, in the church uh, who have been treated for Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And one of the treatments for it is radiation treatment. 
Now, that's not to say the child should not get a treatment because there's no guarantee that you're going to get it, but there's a slightly higher risk. It's usually very, very early. And I have taken care of a few people who have had radiation when they were in their um, like late teens, or early 20s to treat a cancer, a different cancer. And they, they came up in their 30s and 40s with DCIS. They, I've never seen anyone who come up with advanced stage cancer because they've had that. So that's not a reason for you not to take that treatment because that's life-saving at the time. And we can deal with it on the back end for the few that do develop that. Now, I if I put a slide in here because I had another talk and I, I, I put the slide in here. And on one side is cancer, the other side is diabetes. Why? Because diabetes is like the scourge of the earth, okay? It is a scourge of the earth and people, the rates of diabetes are up, including um, used to be when, when you had young people with diabetes, it's because of type one diabetes. Now, because of our obesity issue, we have teenagers and adolescents, even preteens with type two diabetes, which is a direct result of what? Obesity and lack of exercise. And when you look at the, 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 the death rates, um, diabetes as an independent factor is eight. But when you look at the one, two, three, four, five, six factors that are, are the high factors in death rates in the country, cardiovascular disease, stroke, et cetera, all of them, the risk factor is diabetes. So when you com combine all of them together with diabetes, diabetes is, is worse than cancer, it's worse than anything else when it comes to a poor life, and death, kidney disease, and the other things that it causes. Yet we, you know, people don't panic when the doctor tell them they have diabetes, but they panic when they hear they have cancer. Look at this. Diet, it's the same thing. Weight, it's the same thing. Obesity, it's the same thing. Tobacco use, environmental exposure, and of course, genetic. Okay? So the risk factors are the same. So when people say they want to decrease their risk, no, you know, they're looking for some magic bullet. They're looking for some herb. The herb, I call it the herb du jour. I remember when Noni was a craze and I was, you know, and, and then I see uh, there's always something, but they're all nothing. Okay. There's no magic herb. It's, it's a simple thing. Diet, maintaining a good weight and eating a healthy diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, low carbs and, um, increasing the plant-based protein. If you have a chance, watch the, the, the series on Netflix called 100, and it's about the blue zones, and it includes Omelina. But even without that, just, just watch it because there's so much information that you can get from it because this is the way to prevent cancer. It's also the way to make you healthy because some people are going to have it no matter what because we live in a world of sin. But if you are at a good weight and you're in good health, you can go through your treatment much better than someone who is already cowed down with diabetes and the comorbidities that come with it. The risk factors, leading cause of death in the, in the US, okay? These are the risk factors, smoking and tobacco use, number one, alcohol or substance use, COVID, okay? COVID is, and before, prior to 2020, COVID was not, there because it, it wasn't a risk factor. But even when you get back to COVID, if you look at the people who died from COVID, they had uh, many of them had this, many of them had this, many of them had this, many of them had this. So even though it's up there as an independent factor, a large number of the people who got sick enough to die from COVID had all of these in addition to the COVID. Diabetes is here, but again, it is, if you look at the risk of cardiovascular disease, it is right up there with smoking, okay? Obesity and high fat diet, sedentary lifestyle, it is a killer. It is a killer, and we need to recognize it as it is. We look at the, the, the cause of death again. He, here it is number eight when you look at the numbers, but we know that with heart disease, diabetes is one of the risk factors, okay? With COVID, death, diabetes is one of the risk factors. Stroke, diabetes is one of the risk factor, And we're even thinking that it's part of that. So if you were to add this plus all of these, diabetes is really the number one thing 
this is just the end result, but it is, a, and I cannot overemphasize it because it's the same thing. Diet, exercise, overweight, sedentary lifestyle, and um, high processed foods, that is what is killing us. We can treat cancer, but those are the things that are killing us. So that's my little soapbox. So how do we actually prevent this? It's the same thing. The same thing that you would do to, to get rid of your diabetes hypertension, which is to change your diet and start exercising. It's the same thing. There are two, two acronyms that we use, a healthy lifestyle. Basically, that those are the things that are going to help you. Creation, choice, you make a choice. I'm going to live healthier. You need enough rest. You have to look at your environment. And this, this has to do with where you live, um, you know, whether you're in an environment where you have good ventilation and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Activity. You have to keep moving. You know, it's Adventism is a movement and we should be part of the movement. I remember years ago, I, I when I was at Andrews, we used to have a Black History Week. And I forget the name of this pastor, but he, he said this, I never get it. He said, here comes us Adventists. Get in all you can, can in all you get, and sit in on it. Okay? And that's the way we treat our life. We have all this information about Jesus and his love. And we come to church every week. We go to this church because this preacher is preaching and so on. And we get all that information. So we get in all we can. Then we can in all we get. And then we're sitting on it. And at the same time, we're becoming obese and unhealthy. No, we have to move. Trust in God. It's in the middle. Interpersonal relationship. Because trust me, stress, especially stress that comes from when you're in an environment in which you're poor in personal relationships with family, that always is the destruction of the family. As we're talking in Sabbath school today, I said one of the biggest effects when you look at sin, right? When um when Eve came, when Adam God had Adam um name all these animals, and Adam realized that he was alone. God said it's not good for man to be alone. So he put him to sleep, he made Eve. Okay. Wonderful. He woke up. What did he say? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But after sin. It's the woman you gave me, God. I'm telling you, interpersonal relationships. So we need to get back to the point where interpersonal relationship is reflecting our up, our vert, where our horizontal relationship is reflecting our vertical relationship. That's the one with God. Outlook, how you look on life. One of the things that bothered me during this COVID crisis is the number of Christians, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, who took their lives. I know one personally, and it's still, every time I think about it, and we had only been in COVID for a year. And then when I was watching the Southeastern Conference, um, I think it was Friday night speaker, the young man, you could hear his voice cracking as he talked about this young man, the young preacher, he's talking about this young man. He was a leader in Pathfinders. He was a junior deacon. He was all these things, wonderful things. But when COVID came and there was no church, 17-year-old, uh, someone who you'd say, you got to look up to him. He took his life. Seventh-day Adventist, young man. He wasn't out there in the clubs. He wasn't doing drugs. But still, there was no interpersonal relation with God and there was no outlook to say something would be better. There was just an outward thing. You know, we were very busy as Adventists. And the other person who I know personally took his life, same thing. He's one of the best Sabbath school teachers I knew. Young, good looking man. Um, well, he's middle aged by now. When we met each other, we're all young. And I'm like, how does this happen? Because you got to get that trust in God. You got to, and you have to have an outlook. You have to know that there's something else for you. So these are some of the things. And you say, what does that have to do with cancer? It has everything to do with cancer. My friend, Dr. Sabalo will tell you, um, I don't know if, if Dr. Sankey has had her on here, but she she's a um, uh, mental health counselor. She'll tell you, it's your outlook. Very important. Nutrition. Like I said, watch that program on um, the Blue Zones because one of the things that is evident in the Blue Zones is the lack of cancer in the Blue Zones. 
despite the fact that they come from families. In fact, one guy had cancer, moved back to Sardinia at age 60 something, thinking he was gonna die, so he wanted to be home. Well, in the interview, he was 80 something and it was lung cancer, okay, not breast cancer. Breast cancer has a very high rate of, of the, the lung cancer. People die from lung cancer, okay? Nutrition, what you eat, your outlook on life, it's very important. New Start is another acronym. This was the original one. Again, it's, they're saying the same thing. You're saying a little differently. Nutrition, exercise, water, water. What we're talking about water in the beginning, the importance of water. Drink more water. It's it's a it's an isolated incident when you, someone has water toxicity. Those people are crazy, and it can happen. But for you and I, no, we're not going to get no toxicity. Drink more. If you think you have enough, then drink one more glass. Okay, sunlight, getting outside. Even though we live here in Florida, I know it can get very hot. As as Ella Pearson would say, um, Doctor P, he's a naturalist at at Mount Olive. He would say you get out early in the morning, you get that sun when it's not too hot, and you get outside. Uh, temperance, you know, this is this is part of the reason why we have such obesity problems, uh, and and why we we end up endangering our own lives. We go from one extreme to the other. Okay, temperance, temperance, temperance means a temperate climate is not too hot, is not too cold. It's the Goldilocks principle. Temperance, you know, not too hard, not too soft. You know, you don't need to go to extremes of every anything. Temperance, air. One of the recommendations is to go out again early in the morning before the hustle and bustle and just take some deep breaths outside. Rest, this is so underestimated, especially for those who are struggling with weight. Part of the problem is you're not getting enough sleep. You don't have a, enough time for your cycle to recycle um, and you need rest. And of course, most importantly, trust in God because without this, Nothing else you do matter. I think there's a song that says that. Now, just a moment, just a moment, because we gotta address this. Uh, what what they call it now? What this this person who was and wants to be back in alternate facts? There's no such thing. There's a fact and there's a lie. Okay, Proverbs six sixteen six six things God hate. Yea, seven. Somebody who lies. Somebody who shows discord. Somebody who deceives. Somebody who sows discord. Okay, don't listen to them. They're only for their own benefits. There's no evidence that deodorants cause breast cancer. None. If you just think about it, it, it don't make no sense for that. If deodorants cause breast cancer, then men would die from breast cancer at the same rate. Mammograms do not cause breast cancer. In fact, now with all the digital stuff, the amount of radiation is so minuscule. Large breasts, no. Whether you have large breasts or small breasts has to do with genetics and how we, and how what's what you're doing at the time of the development. Like people who tend to be obese at that time, even if they lose the weight later, they're still going to have those breasts. Vegetarians can and do get breast cancer. Um, the cancer that you see almost never in vegetarians is is colon cancer, but that's the only one that we have seen where. You, you do not see it. You just don't see it. Uh, it would be very unusual case. One of the things that we do see in vegetarians, we are seeing a lot of pancreatic cancer. I believe it's because of the nitrates for the, from the fake food that we used to use years ago. The, a lot of the, sub, the, the, um, the meats are not as processed and they're, they're much more naturally made and they don't have all those nitrates that they used to have. But I remember how salty and stuff that's, that stuff was. I remember my mom had come to the US and she had bought one and we, we were trying to fix it. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is what we're supposed to eat. But if you're a true vegetarian and you eat the lentils and the beans and the legumes and the nuts, now, yeah. um, part of the reason why we do have um, so many vegetarians who are getting cancer is because we're using substitutes instead of the actual um, things. How do you treat that? First, you got to find it. Okay, and as you saw in those pictures earlier, a mammogram can save your life because it can find it when you cannot, no matter how hard you palpate, you're not gonna find that. Um, ultrasound helps define it. You get a biopsy. Sometimes you need MRI, PET scans, there are other studies that are done. Treatment always involves some sort of surgery. 
Uh, radiation therapy may be necessary. Chemotherapy may be necessary. Hormonal therapy may be necessary. I'll tell you guys what I told one of my patients one time when she was like, well, you know, I'll take this, but I don't want that. And I said to her, you're not at Olive Garden, okay? I'm not giving you a menu because you like, um, you know, jerk jerk chicken pasta versus somebody want pasta pomodoro. No, we're talking about your cancer and the state that you're in. And these are the choices if you want to get better. And so these are decisions you're going to make with your doctor and not, you know, based on your cousin, sister, brother, auntie, um, father, mother who had cancer 30 years ago, which you're not even sure if they have cancer. And, and they claim that this is what they did. You're doing it based on what your doctor has said and you've asked the questions that you need to ask and you've gotten the answers and um, you're, you're actually praying for God to give you direction, not praying, not demanding miracle, okay? These are fictional treatments. There's no herbal medicine that can cure cancer and there's no such thing as alternative medicine when it comes to cancer. Okay, dietary changes can help you live a healthier life, regardless of whether or not you have cancer, but there's no herb out there that can cure any cancer and there's no alternative medicine. Someone came to me um, and told me that, oh, this guy's really good and he cured somebody of stage five breast cancer. I didn't say anything to him um, because those of you who are in the medical field knows that once you hear that, you know that that person is bogus because there's no just thing as stage five breast cancer. And the other thing that came to me as I was listening to him, I said to myself, you know, we, 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 we spread these things and people tell us stuff and we believe them and, and without any evidence. But let's think about it. Steve Jobs, multi-billionaire who created, um, the iPhone, right? He died from pancreatic cancer. Michael Landon died from ca pancreatic cancer. Uh, what was his name? John McCain died from cancer. Kennedy died from cancer. All these people, rich and famous, died from cancer. And somebody who drives a little hoopty, who lives in a rented house or some little house somewhere can cure cancer. Does that make any sense to you whatsoever? No, it doesn't. But we believe what we want to believe. So the choice is ours. What do we need to do? We really need to change our lifestyle. Low-fat diet, routine exercise, adequate sleep. Those are the three tenets. Okay? Mammogram saves lives, both at early stage and at later stage. Examine yourself. Okay, examine yourself. If people say, I don't know what to feel for. If you're examining yourself every month, the same time each month, if you're still seeing your period, I suggest you do it a week after your period has ended. So you do it the same time each month. So your breast should feel about the same. If you're postmenopausal, then just pick a date and do it every month. Why? Because as many people as I examine in the office, as much as I try to document, these are yours. You have them with you 24-7. So if you're examining yourself every month, you will feel if there's something different, okay? We're not asking you to make a diagnosis. We're just asking you to take notice that something is different. Yearly physicals, yearly pap smears, yearly physical exam, which is include uh, examining your breast. That's how you find it. Here's what you do. You think you found a lump? There's the thing to do. Make an appointment. Get a mammogram and or ultrasound, depending on your age. You may need a biopsy. If you're not satisfied, you get a second opinion. Do not panic. Do not worry. Do not think it's going to magically go away. Do not take start some herb or something, something to go on totally about. Do not go to the internet in search of your own diagnosis. Every year, I get several women, some of them younger, some of them older, who have watched a breast cancer grow and grow to the point where they cannot deny it. And despite the fact that they were doing this and that, you know, they're crying, oh, I thought it would go away, but it didn't. So at what point in time do you, do you seek help? 
Okay? There's no magic. There's God, but there's no magic. These are some trusted websites if you if you need additional information about breast cancer. Okay? And here's a fact. This is just new um, because uh, I, I change the slides every now and then, and I was just doing some rate. This is the overall five-year survival now for breast cancer, 90.8%. Why? Because so many people are paying attention. So many people. Here's the fact. God is in control. We pray. We claim the promises. We do the right thing. Somebody sent me something and I sent it out to a few people. It's called Calm. It's based on um, Philippians 4. It says, celebrate God goodness, rejoice in the Lord always. Ask God for help. Ask with prayer and thanksgiving. And then L is leave your troubles at the cross. So you're going to leave them there. And M is meditate on God's word. Okay, God is in control. There's nothing that happens to us that God doesn't ha already have a way. Ellen White says he has a thousand ways, a thousand ways. So don't think that if you have cancer, it's a curse or whatever, or you need to try to fix it. If you genuinely go to God, he will show you what to do. And you will not be fooled by those who are telling you these things. And you will do the right thing and you will you will get better. And regardless of your outcome, we have to be like the three Hebrew boys. We pray, we trust. And if he if he takes us out of the fire furnace, if he throws us into the fire furnace, so be it. If he doesn't, if he saves us, then so be it. But we cannot be demanding miracles. We cannot be going to people um, one thing I tell people all the time, this was revealed to me as clear as I'm talking to you now, because it's, it's someone I know who had pancreatic cancer and had started to go to one of these people who claim and was having them do all kinds of stuff. And it, it was revealed to me, and I believe it 100%. From the moment they told me, and these were good Christian people, these were not fanatics, but somehow cancer makes people crazy. The minute they told me what they were doing, I knew that she was going to die because God will never give his glory to shysters, to people who make claims that they cannot do. He will never do that. And even though the people claim to be cured, I know for a fact that there are people who are going around right now saying that they have been cured for cancer. And I know for a fact they didn't have cancer. So you cannot listen to them unless you have unless they're willing to say, can I see the pathology report? Can I show it to my doctor? And so on. And, and don't let them tell you, oh, and it's HIPAA. There's none of, every one of my cancer patients, if I say to them, this lady is here, she wants to talk to you, every one of them, every one of them say, yes, I can talk to her. Yes, I can show the record. Yes. Every one of my cancer patients. Because if they tell you that you, they can't do that because, you know, it's HIPAA, no. If someone is cured from cancer, they are happy to share their information. The only way they tell you no is because they, they know that they're, they're creating something that doesn't happen, okay? And these are these are Adventist people, you know. This is not somebody out there in another church or have some TV program. So that doesn't mean that you can trust them. But here's who you can trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your, your own understanding. Here it is, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. You can't be angry at the doctor, or angry at people because you have a diagnosis. You truly have to give it up to God and let him show you what to do. For I alone know the plans that I have for you. That's what he says. He alone knows plans. So whatever, God really has only one plan for us. As I was studying to, to, to teach Sabbath school lesson last week, it just came to me as clear as anything. You know, we we may have plans to do stuff, and as I've had some changes and some things in my life, it, it is very clear to me God only has one plan, and that is for our salvation. And yes, some people have cancer. In Isaiah 43 says, some are going to go through fire, some are going to go through river, some are going to go through all of that. But there's only one plan, to give you a future and a hope. So whatever God allows, he has, and Ellen White says, a thousand ways to deal with it. 
you don't have to go to extremes to deal with it, but you do have to trust him and you have to be willing to listen. You know, you can't go to him telling him, I, I want to say, oh, I rebuke it, rebuke it in Jesus' name. This is not a demon. Okay? I, and I, I, I'm going to pause for a second and say something about that. Because if you're in a car accident and you break your leg, you're not going to rebuke that in Jesus' name. You're going to go to the hospital. Your bone is sticking out. You're going to go. You're going to let them operate. You're going to let them fix it. Okay? So why do you think that with cancer, if, if God allowed an accident to happen and you, you need surgery or whatever, so how is it that now with cancer, you're going to tell God what to do? That you don't want the medical expertise that he has given us. You want him to just miraculously heal it. But that's exactly what we do, unfortunately. He has only one plan to save us. He may take us through cancer, he may not. But whatever it is, if we're trusting in him, we'll do the right thing. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is staying on you because he trusts in you. Regardless of what's happening, you will have peace. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, let me stop sharing so we can go back to our screen. And we just want to trust God and allow him to um, direct our lives and know that whatever happens in our lives, he has a plan for us and we can trust him to, to provide the way out. Okay? And uh, we're open for questions. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. It's supposed to be the 515. <laughs> uh, was a little longer now. <laughs> That's okay. Thank, thank you, you so that. much. You had so much great information. I really appreciate you coming and present to us. I saw in the chat one um, of the participants were asking if they can use your presentation. To, they have a family group getting together and they want to know if they can use your presentation for, you know, to show to the family group that they're going to can um i know it's already recorded that's not a right. problem right right mm -hmm. okay let's see what else question we have in the chat um very important just, detail that's not... just jennifer i thought you'd be asleep by now how many hours i had is she i am is not that, sure. isn't that jennifer i don't think it's jennifer maybe it's one of the uh, somebody's with a sanky name yeah <laughs> Not, oh, there's, oh, there's another Sankey on yeah, here. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. about to say, I said, she yeah. should be asleep. Come on, daughter's in Austria, and I know she was asleep. Well, I yeah. can't say that, okay. but I think she's asleep right now. <laughs> okay. You okay, know, thank when you, you, Sister Sankey. Yeah, you're talking about dense breasts. I often have a picture in my mind, somebody with dense, dense breasts is somebody who's obese and maybe have this dense breast. So uh, somebody who is slim, a skinny person can have that type of dense breast. It's actually it's usually them. Obese people yeah. usually are fatty replace births. Oh, fatty, yeah. And and the cancer is much easier to find in them. Right. Because I know of someone who's very very skinny, slim person, and they were diagnosed with cancer. Um mm -hmm. and it was because of dense breasts. Now, estrogen, what what role does this estrogen play in breast cancer? Okay. So estrogen, what, what we found out is that um, some cancers are actually estrogen positive and progesterone positive. Uh, those cancers actually have a better prognosis than those that are estrogen negative and estrogen progesterone negative. Those cancers that are estrogen and progesterone positive, in addition to the surgery, whatever else we give them, we have given them... Um, hormonal therapy and tumors have shrunk with hormonal therapy just like it would with chemotherapy so that's the estrogen and progesterone a lot of times when i say to the patient oh your estrogen and progesterone positive they think it's a bad thing it's actually a good thing if you have a cancer that is estrogen progesterone positive it's actually a good thing those cancers in general do much better and sometimes when even when I have patients with a later stage cancer who present to me a later stage and their ERP are positive, you you surprise how well they do because it's just it's just something we it's a nature, it's something we test. There's there's a bunch of other tests we when I was starting medical school, the only thing we had, we had just developed the estrogen and progesterone. Now when I have a report in addition to the type of cancer, whether it's invasive or some other structural stuff, there's now six six or seven different 
test that's done even on that little strip of biopsy tissue and they 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 really tell us the her2 the mib the pk they really tell us really prognosis in terms of tumor behavior and people with certain levels um like a her2 positive is, is not the greatest her2 negative is better Black women, unfortunately, have a higher rate of what we call triple negative cancer, meaning they're estrogen negative, they're progesterone negative, and they're HER2 positive. Even though we call it triple negative, um, those three factors together are like, you know, the the ugly, the worst, and and the worst, even more worse. So though they just have a higher risk of recurrence, they have a higher risk of um of, of of the cancer being more aggressive. So even though you may have a small tumor like the little tiny one we saw, uh, those patients are treated with chemotherapy, even though they have a lumpectomy and every they're treated with chemotherapy you know, like for two years and so on, because those tumors are just more aggressive. And that is one of one of the reasons for the higher rate of death in black women is that we have a higher rate of triple negative breast cancer. So one of the ways to counteract it is to find it early in terms of um, increasing survival rates. Okay. So some, if someone has, um, uh, let's see, uh, posit, um, the um, estrogen positive, um, progesterone positive, her two negative. Negative. Right. That's a good prognosis. That's a good prognosis. Yeah, so a they do the best. Yeah, a ten, like if you have a 10 centimeter tumor, a lumpectomy would be good. Do they have to do a, well, a lumpectomy? A lumpectomy is based on, on a couple of things. It's based on the okay. size of the tumor and the size of the breast. Because okay. in order for you to remove cancer, like I said, it's like, you know, when a stone hits your windshield, right. you have that burst in the middle and you have spikes going out. So right. when you do breast cancer surgery, you have to go around your goal is to go around and to try to right. take the tissue around it so you have margins, okay? So if you have a size A breast, even if you have a one centimeter tumor, that can still be challenging. It's certainly if you have a two centimeter tumor, it's challenging. Oh. Typically anything above five centimeters, we rarely ever will do a lumpectomy <laughs> on. But there's some people with really big breasts so even five centimeters is about two two inches, right? Okay. So even if somebody has a two inch diameter tumor and you know they got a E size or a big D size breast, you can take that out, take out a big chunk, and the breast still looks good because there's so much tissue there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's based on that. So one of the things that are we do now is we do what's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy and neoadjuvant hormonal therapy. And what that does is, what that means in, in layman's term is that we give you chemo before, we give you hormonal therapy before, if you're one of those that would benefit from hormonal therapy. And a lot of times that will shrink the tumor. Not everybody responds. Some people, they start with chemotherapy and they they do not respond. And if you do not respond, there's no point in continuing it. But for the ones who respond, they give it to them for about six months and it can shrink that thing down to the point where you can't even feel it anymore. Uh, or when you do an ultrasound, you don't see it. We still remove it because studies, they actually have done studies, you know, and everything we do, we do studies. They actually, a few years ago, they had randomized people to um, leaving it alone because we couldn't see anything and um, actually removing it. When you remove it, you find that even though on the x-ray you don't see anything, when they slice it up and do their stains, there's still tumor there. So, but what that can do, and I've had patients like that, some patients, they came with a big lump for whatever reason, you know, because like I said, nobody wants to believe that it could be cancer. So people will keep it there, whatever. So they come in, we give them the new adjuvant therapy and that thing shrinks down to the point where I can now do a lumpectomy. I can now take it out and still have a decent size, decent look of breast. Because there's no point in doing a lumpectomy and have your breast look like Frankenstein, okay? So, uh, and, and we have some techniques now we call oncoplastic surgery, where we combine some plastic surgery techniques with um, our regular surgical techniques in order to have the breast looking nicer than um, just, you know, like you would just take a chunk out of it. Mm -hmm. oh. That's good to know. Very good information. Good. Anyone else with um, a question? You can post it in the chat or you can 
raise your hand or ask your question. Yeah. So you talk about replacement therapy, um, you know, hormonal replacement th therapy. I've heard about this bioidentical therapy. The bioidentical therapy, are they using um, natural? They're using, they're using plant based products. Right. Um, that's supposed to give you the same effect. That's why they call it bioidentical, Bio. mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. if you were taking hormones, the actual hormones, either synthetic or, like I said, Premarin. Um, that that's what they're using. Um, so far, they they're saying that it's not um, doesn't have the same effect as the additional hormone therapy. And most of the time, that is used for patients who are having symptoms um, like hot flashes or you know because. One of, one of the problems with vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes, as we call them, is not just simple of, of uncomfortableness. Some people are waking up and they can't go back to sleep. And as we talked about diet and exercise and the importance of maintaining that, if you're not sleeping well, you're not going to be well, period. Okay. It, it's going to take a toll on you. Um, there are times when you're working. Uh, you can't imagine you're working and all of a sudden now you're sweating like crazy. It's not like you can just say, okay, excuse me, I'm going to go to the bathroom and change my clothes because depend on the severity of it. Sometimes you just feel hot, but sometimes people are literally sweating. So yes, um, if people have severe symptoms, they, they will need some sort of replacement, um, moderate to severe symptoms. A lot of people mild symptoms don't, don't worry about it, but if you have moderate to severe symptoms, you may need to get some sort of therapy just so you can function. You know that there's a slight risk, but to be honest with you, I tell people all the time, I say, read a bottle of Tylenol. Just read the insert because, you know, we take it all the time or any <laughs> any over-the-counter medicine, any over-the-counter medicine, you read that piece of paper that's there, go online and look at it. Aspirin, if aspirin had been developed like now, or even in the 20th century, it would have been prescription only because of the potential side effects of, of it. So um, if you need to take it, don't think, oh, I'm going to die. No, you're not. You just need to have higher surveillance. But there's a difference between needing something so you can function and what they were doing in the 80s, which proved to be a bad thing, which is that they were given everybody. Everybody. You go to OBGYN, they were giving them, oh, um, Oh, you hit menopause. Oh, let's give you this hormone. No. Yeah. So yeah. now it's more selective in the use because some women actually do need it. I remember I had one breast cancer patient and she was, she said, Dawson, if I don't have the hormone replacement, it's true. She said, I'll kill everybody in my family. Trust me. Because she was so agitated. So you have to look at quality of life, you know, and yes, it may put her at higher risk. And of course, now she had breast cancer. But, you know, we can do mammograms, we can follow up, we can find her. And the risk is not like tremendous. It's not like it's a 70% risk. It's, it's like an increase by maybe 5%. And, you know, she's already in her late 60s, 70s. So once you get to late 60s, according to the Bible, you only have a few more years. Now, of course, people are living into their 80s, but it's, it's not like you, it's not like you're 20, you know, and you're really going to increase your risk. You could die from anything. So if you're really uncomfortable and not able to function, yes, you, you may need to take actual hormones or some of the bioidentical have been working for, for some people. And some people just tough it out. But if it get to the point where it's really disruptive in your life, you um, then you, you need to do something. Because if you can't function, th that stress alone will cause a myriad of other problems that you know worry about a, a slight increased risk in, in cancer. And we're, we're praying for Janelle. She broke her leg in a car accident. Okay. Oh, wow. okay. Okay, that's her prayer request. Okay, thanks again, Dr. Sinclair, for coming and do this talk for us. We really appreciate it. We have learned so much. I know I have learned a whole lot and have opened my eyes to a lot more things. So thank you. And if there, there aren't any more questions, we're going to go ahead and... um. Close off this section. I'm going to do stop taping and we're going to go into a prayer request and then we are going to close off this session. Um, where's recording? Oh, stop recording.